I'm just going to do a brief introduction on the two speakers and then we'll go straight to the main talk. So our two speakers tonight are Dr. Eddie O'Connor and John Fitzgerald of Supernode. Dr. Eddie is the chairman of Supernode and is the founding force behind Supernode, a cutting edge technology development company that designs and delivers superconducting connection systems to connect renewable generation and increase grid interconnection in, in mature markets. He has pioneered the concept of the supergrid in response to the challenge of decarbonizing electricity generation in Europe and formulated the initial proposals for the supergrid in 2001, which resulted in the establishment of the Friends of the Supergrid, the precursor to much of the consortia that have moved the concept forward since then. He has a lifelong career in the energy sector in Ireland, working with ESB and Board Namorna before founding Airtricity in 1998, which within 10 years became a leading global renewable energy company with developments throughout Europe and North America. In 2008, Eddie set up Mainstream Renewable Power, which he also developed into a leading global renewable energy company with projects spanning five continents. John Fitzgerald, beside on the right, or on the left as you look, is the CEO of Supernode. John has extensive experience in power systems and grid infrastructure, and prior to joining Supernode, he was the Director of Grid Development Interconnection in Airgrid, the Irish TSO, with responsibility for all onshore transmission and the development and operation of interconnection. John was Project Director of the East-West Interconnector, directly connecting the electricity markets of Ireland and Britain for the first time in 2012, and was also the largest high-voltage DC scheme of its kind in the world. Before joining Airgrid, John was involved in business development for ESB International, where he held a number of business development management positions in Europe and in Asia. He was involved in the successful development of major energy infrastructure projects and corporate initiatives in the electricity and gas sectors across Ireland and in the UK and Europe. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Eddie O'Connor to give the opening 15 minutes or so of the talk, and he will in turn hand on to John. So over to you, Eddie. Hello. Yeah, just press the button, the other one. This, this is press. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Thanks very much. Why? Yeah, you're gone. You're good. Am I all right now? Yeah. Thanks, boss. Um, <laughs> Thank Tony. That's the right one. Yeah. yeah. I want to thank Tony for organizing tonight uh, and thank you all for being in attendance here. Um, <clears throat> I just, I suppose, want to talk a little bit first about uh, the problem that, you know, why we're here and why we're dealing with this, uh, with this issue and pollution uh, from carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases has, has got to all kinds of strange proportions that even surprise me. Uh, in 1989, I, I, I learned when I was chief executive of Board Namona that there was a big problem with CO2 in the atmosphere that was causing heating, and I hadn't realized that John Tyndall from Carlow had discovered this in 1861 while working in the Royal Institution in London. But uh, George Lee was on television last night, I don't know if many of you saw the news, and he said that Europe had been undergoing uh, heating uh, 0.5 of a degree uh, every 10 years for the last 15 or the last 30 years since 1990. So we've already passed this mythical 1.5 degrees uh, that um, the UN says we're trying to control uh, the temperature to. Uh, that's already bypassed in Europe. And I don't believe we have any chance whatsoever of achieving the, the two degrees that the United Nations has set. And we'd be lucky to, to do three degrees. Now, two degrees was the was the one where uh, there was supposed to be catastrophic uh, events happening. Well, there are catastrophic events happening. A study by Harvard and, and a number of English universities in the recent past found that there was 8 million people died every year due to uh, the effects of burning uh, fossil fuels. Uh, and uh, I've seen a similar study in the University of Exeter, which reckon those 4.5 million people. So there's, there's a lot of people there's a lot of people dying uh, from this stuff, as well as the total destruction of uh, of, if you like, Pakistan, where six million people are, are uh, have all had to move, uh, where the Lake Chad uh, in Africa has is now about eight percent of the size it was forty years ago, ten point seven million people. For those of us in Europe who have looked at the migration across the uh, Mediterranean, 
we should be looking upon these uh, African happenings, the, uh, the Sahara moving south with enormous askance, because where are they going to go when, when there's no place left to live there, except up into Europe? And you see how fragile our democracies are in Europe uh, when assaulted by a whole bunch of immigrants. Anyway, uh, so we can move on to the slide, John, please. Uh, here's a, um, a map, two maps of Europe's resources. Um, the, on the, on the left-hand side, you can see it's, it's a, a kind of a rough map of the wind, but there you can see the special position that Ireland occupies. Um, the darker the blue, the less wind you have, and the, the more you trend, trend towards green and yellow, the, the stronger the wind. So off, off the co west coast of Ireland, we ought to be able to get 65% capacity factor from our wind farms. And if you, if you consider that on, in the North Sea, we, in, in various guises, in particularly in electricity down off the Thames estuary, and then with mainstream off uh, Yorkshire and off Scotland, we developed 4,100 megawatts. Off Yorkshire, the capacity factor was 55%, and off uh, Scotland, it was 53%. So, uh, and you know, this is, this is way above anything that can be achieved on land. So Northern Europe is the place for, for the high wind speeds. And then if you look at the, um, the solar irradiance on the, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, the, the deeper the red, uh, the more intensity, the irradiation there for the capacity factors from solar down there would probably be in the order of 30%, just about. In, in Ireland, I hear from people who are developing solar farms, maybe 11 or, or 12%. Okay, we can move on then to the next slide, please, John. Now, so if we, if we, the only strategy that's available to us that I could see uh, that makes any sense and that's going to completely decarbonize is if we use the natural resources above ground that we have at our disposal. So we've got solar, we've got wind, we've got wind onshore, we've got wind offshore. Uh, I didn't put it up here because it's, it's it's small by comparison, but we will still have about the same amount of nuclear uh, that we have now. Nuclear energy is, is good for making electricity in this sense, that it doesn't release any CO2. The only problem with nuclear is it's very expensive, and it creates cesium and strontium, um, and, and these have a half-life 30 years, uh, which you have to look after all those. Uh, very, you know, radioactive materials for a period of 30 years after the nuclear power station shuts down, and there's no cash flow coming from the sale of electricity uh, to pay for that. So who's, who, who pays for that? Well, in Britain, they put five billion every year into Sellafield, uh, and that's been going on for about 40 years. So look, if you look at those numbers there, a gigawatt, as you know, is, is a thousand megawatts. So we're talking about a million megawatts of solar, 750,000 megawatts of offshore wind, uh, and 450,000 uh, megawatts of onshore wind. Uh, now, you know, so the great bulk of electricity uh, will be coming from offshore wind in Europe, and that's a fairly major change uh, from what's happened up to now. Uh, we've, we've run into, well, <laughs> everybody in the Midlands knows about the problems we had about six years ago when we tried to develop the Midlands for uh, to sell electricity to England, and then England didn't want it, so it kind of petered out. Uh, but those type of objections to wind, uh, visual intrusion, noise, shadow flicker, what have you, uh, in addition, of course, to the alleged schizophrenia, and, um, and, and well, of course, yes, I better not go on with this theme. Um, anyway, it's difficult enough to build on land, and the capacity factors are actually quite low. The average capacity factor in Ireland uh, since wind uh, was established is about 27 percent now that surprised me i looked it up recently and it that's quite low because i know when we developed electricity we were we were hoping to get 40 percent capacity factor because we're building in in very energetic areas but which hardly had any grid so you run out of grid very quickly on land okay so we can go to the next uh, slide so the story is offshore wind and there are some places in Europe where you can build uh, with fixed foundations, like when we built the Arklow Banks wind farm in, in 2003 with uh, using GE equipment, there were 3.6 megawatt turbines, so seven of them there, and one got hit by lightning and to my amazement went on fire recently. I, I, I was absolutely certain that these things were designed 
uh, to be able to withstand lightning because you only get lightning sometime during the life of a, of a wind a wind farm. I don't know what happened to it because it's owned. It's not owned by us. Uh, but and we've built up to now all the four thousand four hundred megawatts we developed in the North Sea were all fixed uh, foundations. But for Ireland off the west coast, we're going to be using the type of foundations that you see up here. Now there's there's all kinds of designs of these. There's about thirty different designs that I've heard about so far, and and the, you know the one if you on the on the right hand uh, picture there, and second from the right, you've got the spar. And that's just a straight up and down. And then you have tripods, with three floating things with the wind turbine um, um, sitting in, in uh, over one of the one of the three uh, floaters. And the most important part, as you all will know, um, engineers working for county councils, uh, that the foundations are the most important part of any uh, thing, particularly uh, when you're offshore. You can't have these things moving at all. And it's interesting that the there's there's a, a demonstration, I think, seven turbines again in the North Sea in the book and deep between Norway and, and Scotland. And no matter what wind speed they've encountered, and they've encountered some crashing storms, uh, the deflection at the top in the nacelle is only three degrees. Now, that's absolutely minuscule uh, when you think about the forces that are at work here. So we've, 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 we've cracked the ability to build offshore. I wouldn't say that any of them is commercial, fully commercial yet, uh, but we've all kinds. And like boats, I think we're going to find that certain types of floating foundations will be suitable to certain types of seas. I can't imagine the Baltic Sea would be anything like as violent as the Atlantic off Ireland, uh, where you get 16 metre swells. Uh, now, to overcome that, you know, engineers can do this and have done it with oil and gas so far. Um, and uh, we could perhaps go on to the next one there, John, please. Here's, here's uh, some examples of, of floating offshore. The, 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 the one on the left-hand side, you can see there that uh, that's what you see is what you get. There is you, you assemble the whole thing in port and you haul it out in the three tugs there and, and where it gets anchored fundamentally and, and soundly to the bottom. Um, and uh, on the right-hand side, what I think might be more interesting for Ireland is foundations made from cement. Um, this will be capable of supporting a 16 megawatt turbine. Uh, it uses about 25,000 tonnes of cement. You know, even though I'm an engineer, it's hard to imagine that floating, but of course it does, or else you wouldn't be doing it. Um, but again, it's assembled in port. Uh, and and hauled out uh, to where it's it's anchored to the, the chains that anchor to the bottom. Those chains obviously are under incredible stress, and and there's big piles underneath the, each of those chains locating them firmly uh, in the ocean floor. Okay, so uh, we can move on, John. Here's here's the 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 great thing about Ireland. We're the only EU country uh, that has the kind of wind speeds that we're talking about. Now, Scotland and Norway uh, and parts of, well, parts of it, no, Scotland and Norway would be the other, other two European countries with those kind of wind speeds. We've got about 10.2 times the area under our ownership in the Atlantic um, than we have on land. So you can see there that this, there's a massive area. We could, if you like, supply the whole of Europe uh, with, this, with this energy, but there's, there's two reasons we won't be able to do that. One is that every other maritime nation in Europe wants to get in on the act. Um, I saw uh, yesterday, I only read that the Nordic countries have got together and say they want to build 230,000 megawatts in, in the Baltic. Now, they, they've got their act together up there, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, Finland, uh, Poland, Sweden. You wouldn't believe how far advanced they are in Ireland. Ireland has done no planning for any of this stuff. The government announced they're going to build 30,000 megawatts off the West Coast, which is great. We could do 10 times that, uh, and we should be planning for that, but there's no plan uh, coming out. There's, there's a big difference between rhetoric and actions. And as, as being uh, engineers and, and anybody else listening in, you can't get any of this stuff without a plan. Uh, I just halt there, uh, just and welcome our former teacher, Brian Cowan. Uh, thanks for joining us, Brian. You're very welcome indeed. Um, thanks for coming along. So uh, 
so here we have uh, a, a, you know an opportunity a business opportunity for ireland uh, that the likes of which we haven't seen and it's transformative actually because we've we've made great wealth out of attracting in the american multinationals uh, and we exist we'd be an almost uninhabited rock off an island off the mainland if we didn't have uh, the 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 ken whittaker approach uh, the ida approach uh, and and the arrival of intel plus literally at this stage hundreds of others which actually determine nearly all of our wealth and certainly all of our public uh, not huge percentage of our public finances comes from the the wages that are paid uh, to the highly um, uh, educated staff that work for these big companies but also the corporate taxation rate which has as you know recently gone from 12 and a half uh, to 15 percent so we have this uh you know, once in, in, in a generation, or maybe once even in two generations, opportunity that Ireland never had before. Well, the technology never existed, and fossil fuels were, you know, you know the advantages of fossil fuels. You can turn them up and down just as, as you please. Uh, so now, John, we go on to the next. So the other reason that we wouldn't be able to supply all of Europe with this wind is this. Um, and, and this is what gave rise to the supergrid uh, when I was thinking about, uh, you see, I came from um, uh, an ESB background and a board Mona background, so I was in the supply of electricity business. I wasn't just, I, I, I was motivated by doing good, if you like, but and I use that in a critical sense. I, I, you know, it was, to me, it was a business proposition, but it was also driven by the fact that we had to do this. The world has to decarbonize. And when the storm arrives off the west coast of Ireland, uh, and on the left-hand side of that drawing that you're, you're looking at there, those graphs, you can see there's a, a little peak in Ireland, and then the storm passes and peaks over England, which is a lot more installed capacity. Then you've got Belgium and Holland, a very big amount of installed capacity in Germany, and so on uh, over uh, Denmark and, and onwards up into Sweden. That's what happens currently where you've no interconnection in Europe. Right. Imagine if you had a big grid there, right, and you had enough generation off the west coast of Ireland. The kind of generation profile that you would get much more resembles what you see on the right hand side. It's almost like firm power. Now, that's quite that was the motivation that drove me to formulate the concept of the supergrid in 2001, because I was preoccupied with the idea of emulating what. Um, you know what happens with with fossil with fossil fuels, and and do I see it as a real criticism of wind that the wind doesn't blow all the time, and and uh, that'd be like criticizing um, humans because we're going to die, you know, like it's just a fact of life. This is the way it is. But you know, you get free fuel here. We spend three hundred and thirty billion a year on on fuel in Europe, uh, and if we went to a hundred percent renewable system we would actually save all that money that's spent every year because the fuel, the basic fuel is free. Uh, and we'd have a payback period of, of something like 7.8 years for the massive spend because that amount of generation and the grid that John is going to take you through in, in a little while, well, I, I'll just deal with it as an introduction, um, would cost about uh, 2.5 trillion. Uh, that's 2.5 million million euros which sounds an awful lot of money, but actually when you say, when you consider that we spend 0.33 of a trillion every year, well, then you're, you're actually into a, you know, a very, uh, a very quick payback period for such a massive piece of infrastructure um, uh, investment. John, I think we go on to the next one now, please. Here's a, 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 a graph that was done by the International Energy Agency showing the massive complementarity between solar uh, in 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 the south and wind in the north, it's an almost perfect match. It's hard to believe that you can get such a um, a correlation as this. But this is this is actual. These are actual readings that were that were got, and they weren't drawn or compiled by me. They were done by the International Energy Agency in Paris. So this is a, a further reinforcement of the concept of the supergrid, uh, which we can just go on to straight away now. So this is the this is this is what is this we we have a parameter here which we had to invent uh, called gigawatt kilometers. So we've got a, about a hundred such links uh, in what you're looking at there, 
and we have 413 gigawatt, 413,000 gigawatt kilometers that has to be built. Um, we are developing the technology for that uh, in, in Supernode. And John, uh, I'm delighted to say that John is heading this up with, with enormous success. Uh, we're, we, you've heard of technology readiness level. Technology readiness level goes from one to nine. One is an idea, nine is a competitive product. Uh, we're at technology level three or four in Supernode at the moment. By 2025, we'll be at technology level six. We'll be starting to demonstrate uh, the, the cables that we're building, and they're based on superconductivity, as John will explain to you now. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you very much. So, um, so first of all, uh, like intuitively, we all know that, that it gets windy, as it is here tonight in the northwest of Europe in the winter, and it's sunny in the, in the Mediterranean basin. Uh, we did a, a study, though, to, to try and try and analyze that and break it down in a, in a more analytical manner. And we looked out to 2050 and we took the targets that Wind Europe and the European Commission have set. And we looked at the growth in electricity, as we saw it over over the next 30 odd years. And we came up with the, we put in the weather data from 2019 and we looked at every hour. So a distribution of renewable energy across Europe, plus nuclear, plus hydro. So this is a decarbonized Europe, circa 2050. And what we found was that with business as usual, which is where we continue to build the Celtic interconnector, the east-west, and a little bit of interconnection, maybe 15, 20% interconnection between member states and national targets for renewables. So every country saying, I'm gonna build this much for me and I'm gonna pay for it myself. And we're all going to do our own nationalistic thing. And we found that the, the cost of energy was about 186 euro to the end user. So that's the cost of energy service. That's what all, all the customers across Europe on average would spend um, on, on electricity. And then we looked at putting in some grids. And um, so we upped that to maybe 40% interconnection between, between member states. So still national distribution, but a greater level of interconnection because while we have a single market in, in theory in energy, we don't really have a single market because there are constraints and there's different energy prices in each market. Some people have got great solar, some people have got great wind, some people have nuclear, uh, more or less. So what we did was we looked at this right across the piece for every hour of the year in 2050 with a 2019 weather profile. And what we found was if you increase the level of interconnection by about, but if you doubled it from 20 to 40%, you got a 32% saving in, in energy costs to the end user. And that's quite a big number. And we put in a cost for transmission. And then we said, well, what happens if there was no constraints? If you could put these floating wind turbines where they, where they have the highest capacity factors and you put the solar panels where the sun shines the most with the highest irradiance, what would it look like? And suddenly you jump up to 50%. So 48%, 50%, twice as cheap the cost of energy served. But that's not practical because that's a that's an unconstrained system and we live in a world full of constraints. So the answer lies somewhere between 40% and unlimited interconnection between countries. And that's when you're talking about your super grid, your pan-European grid. That logic is, prevails not just in, in Europe, but also in America and in Asia and anywhere where the renewable resources are, 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 are good, the best resources are not co-located with the, with the demand. So we all like to live in cities and in urban settings. Uh, more and more that's the case and we're going to need a, a bigger grid to bring decarbonized energy because we won't have the supply chains associated with oil and gas and coal no containers bringing coal around the world just imagine it no pipelines full of oil and no 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 uh, ch4 in our gas pipelines so it's a different it's a different paradigm and we have to get our heads around that the prize is free fuel but we're going to need a bigger uh, energy system to cope with it and these studies bore that out. And that was a study that we did with UCD um, uh, last year. And there should be more studies like this because we've got to figure out how to get to 2050 because we won't get there by incremental steps. We've got to work back from the goal, which is a decarbonized energy system and figure out what it looks like. And we need more of these studies done with greater granularity in Europe. Um, and and it's, it's where the focus needs to be. And this is the first one that I've seen that gets into this level of detail. So we need more grids and I've built my fair share of overhead power lines um, and I've been in many community halls like this explaining why we needed them. Um, and I would say that the cheapest way of moving power from A to B is an overhead power line. 
you won't do it cheaper. You've got uh, conductors uh, hanging in air way above the, 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 um, the ground. So you don't need to insulate them. You don't have to dig it up. It's, it's, it's cheaper uh, and it's a great way. In China, they're moving power long distances and they're the leaders in, 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 in innovation in, in grids uh, because they try things. Their power grid is more of an experiment. We're very focused on secure operation in Europe. We need that. We all want the lights on. In China, they have been more innovative, particularly in the last 20 years. And what you'll see here on your left is the largest uh, power line or uh, electricity circuit in the world. Uh, it's about two years old and it's, it's DC. So it's not AC. So there's only two poles, plus and a minus. And this is bringing 12 gigawatts, 300, sorry, 3,300 kilometers from the Northwest to the, to the population centers on the, on, the, on the Southeast coast. And if you look carefully at this, you'll see some people working on one of the lines. And there's about half a dozen workers on that line. And that gives you a sense of scale. I don't think there are houses in the background, they're factories. This is, this is enormous. This is 350 meter pylons. Um, it's a 12 gigawatt circuit, which is twice the capacity of our entire energy system here in Ireland. This is where things are going in the continental grids. And in China, they're doing it this way. I don't think it'll work in Europe. I don't think you can build them. Our geography is different, so we need a different answer. We need the next best thing. And this is where we got to, Eddie and I, about two, three years ago. And we looked at this. We happened across a new technology that's pretty nascent, and it's called a superconductor. So in the picture here, you'll see old-fashioned, um, ready and reliable copper, which we all rely on and use. Um, and to the right, you'll see some superconducting tapes. Um, they're about 180 times lighter and smaller, and only about 1% of that is the superconducting material. So you're talking about a really small amount of, of material. And when you keep it below its critical temperature, and this was discovered about 100 years ago, there's no resistance. So you can put quite an amount of power in a very small space. And that's the kind of solutions that we're going to need if we're going to supersize our grids. And I mean supersize. Uh, we're talking about electrification increasing from 25% to upwards of 75%. So if you want to look at the future, look at Norway, where they've got plenty of, of, of renewable energy uh, and they have a much higher amount of, of electrification than any other country in Europe, by far and away the highest, I would think. So this is, this is uh, the technology that we've looked at and in terms of the, um, I'm going to put on my glasses here, but in terms of the um, how to achieve it, you do have to cool it down to about minus 200 degrees centigrade. And if you can keep it there reliably, you can rely on this. It's, it's something we use. If you've ever had an MRI scan, this is used in the military, in CERN with the Large Hadron Collider. Um, it's used in an energy setting too. Um, so this is a novel to electricity um, transfer. These are two cities, um, Essen in Germany, which in 2013 uh, commissioned um, a superconducting uh, cable. Uh, there are about a dozen of them in service in the world. These are just two I picked out. Uh, the Shingal project is in Seoul in South Korea. And Eddie and I were out there to, 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 for the opening in 2019. Um, and it's been operational and these, these systems are used because they can get more power from A to B in a tight space. And um, so they use in urban settings. And the, there's one planned, there's one in, in, in progress at the moment in Chicago, um, in America, um, and also in Munich. There's one plan for Munich, which will be 500 MVA, which is quite a considerable amount of power. So they're getting bigger, but it's, slow, it's a slow burn. Um, utilities have to keep the lights on. Um, and their emphasis is on that. So they don't go looking for novel products. They want bread and butter products that are going to be reliable. They've been doing it for a hundred years and there has been very little innovation in electricity systems uh, going way back to Edison. So hundred years ago, we got national grids. We still have national grids. So what we're working on in Supernode in particular, and what are, we're a technology company, and uh, what we're working on is not the superconducting superconductors themselves. They're available, they're mature technology, and they're at technology readiness level nine. What we're really working on is the materials and the thermal management to keep them cool 
and superconducting 24 seven at lowest cost. So we're looking at uh, what's done in other industries, particularly in oil and gas, where there's been a lot of innovation. Um, um, LNG use, use cryogenic pipes with vacuums and insulation to keep the, the, the fluids inside either warm or cold. Um, and in electricity, you can see their state of the art. So that electricity cable is the ampacity cable developed by Nexus, a leading cable company. And you can buy that often in the morning if you want to. It's technology ready, it's level, level nine. And if you wanted it, you could buy it often. Um, so what we're doing in Supernode is looking at this state of the art technology and moving it, moving it on a bit, uh, improving the length we can go before we to recool and replenish the, the liquid nitrogen that we use to keep the, the superconductor cool. And working your way from the inside out, you've got your conductor in the middle. And unlike a regular conductor, which generates heat because it has resistance, what you're trying to do here is to keep it cool. And once you keep it cool, you can put an enormous amount of power on it in a very small space. So it looks like a regular cable from the outside. It's installed the same way, but it's a different proposition on the inside. So once you can keep it cool, with great materials, great insulation and heat, and heat management systems, you're in business. And that's what Supernova are really working on, materials and thermal management. So this is what a cable will look like. And um, so what are the advantages of it? Well, it's more efficient. There are no uh, resistive losses. So you don't lose five or 10% of your energy uh, if you move it over long distances. Um, the, the costs associated with keeping it cool are fixed overhead. So the more power on it, the more you get. So it's scalable, scale is a friend. So the more power you wanna move, the more economic superconductors become. And that's a key point because we're gonna to need to move more power particularly if, if, if member states are to, are to realistically achieve their ambitions. Like if we're gonna do 30 gigawatts, we're not gonna put it through the existing power system here. It was built for six gigawatts and um, supported heavily by fossil fuel supply chains. So it's not, it's not fit for purpose for 30 gigawatts and um, anybody who thinks it is, 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 is deluded. So we gotta get real and we gotta work on new tech that can do this job for us. Um, it has a smaller right away, so you can put this stuff under the seabed, you can put it under the ground, so it's, it's, it's not obtrusive infrastructure. And most importantly, it's, more, it's the most economic way of moving power. So these are the advantages. I'll now move on to what Supernode are doing. So we've been at it, well, really since 2018, but it was 2019 before we really, we really settled upon superconducting as, as, as the solution because of the limitations of copper because there's not enough copper to decarbonize. And that's not, don't take that from me. You read it in the Financial Times this morning, the boss of the biggest copper company in the world said it, that innovation is needed because there ain't enough copper to decarbonize. Um, now, I'm not sure if he's aware of superconductors, um, but in any case, that, that's the copper um, boss's statement. There isn't enough copper, so we're gonna need innovation. We're gonna be at TRL six by 2025. What that means is we will have our full cryostat which we already have in production. We're gonna have that tested in a marine setting and also in a terrestrial setting. At that stage, we'll, we'll be able to confirm what our models tell us. And what our models tell us is that um, this can be 35% cheaper than doing it with copper. So think about it, an energy system that's 50%, 30 to 50% cheaper than without interconnection, an interconnection that's significantly cheaper and where there's enough materials because we need very little material. And that's the key thing. So you'll see the lines here and you can, this, there's quite a bit going on here. This is an offshore connection of a two gigawatt and state of the art at the moment is a 525 kV um, HVDC, which is a high voltage direct current. It's like an interconnector strapped onto a wind farm. They build them in the North Sea. Each platform costs about a billion. With our superconducting technology, we can do the platform for about a fifth of the cost. And even though our cable is more expensive, we can do a two gigawatt link cheaper. But what's more interesting, right, is in the bottom left-hand corner, you see the scale. And this is without an offshore platform. This is pound for pound, kilometer for kilometer, how much cheaper it is to move a lot of power. Now, just bear in mind that pylon, which is the cheapest way of doing it in China, is 12 gigawatts. On this scale here, you'll see one to 10 gigawatts. I think 12 gigawatts is a bit big because if it falls over, you've got to keep the lights on. So you need a grid, You're not just single point to point, you need a grid. We think a DC grid is the best way. And what's really interesting about superconductors is as you, as you increase the scale, the heating or the cooling cost is fixed so it doesn't increase. 
Whereas with, with copper, the resistive losses are directly proportional to the power transfer. So your losses increase as your scale increases. Not so with superconducting technology. This is why it's so interesting. And in relation to this technology, we're not on our own here. We're doing work because firstly, we believe these are some IEEE papers we've done with the Strathclyde University. And we've also done some work with Aberdeen and with UCD. But in relation to the Strathclyde papers, what we really show is that a DC link uh, with a superconductor can be effective for connecting an offshore, large offshore renewable resource. That can be the same for a solar plant as well. But more importantly, we can handle the faults and we can build a DC grid. So it's irrefutable that a DC grid is most appropriate for a European-wide grid. And we believe that a high temperature superconductor is the only way to do a grid at scale because of the limitations of copper, which limit a single cable to two gigawatts. We can do four, six, eight gigawatts, whatever is most appropriate, we can do it. So the most interesting thing about superconductors is its competitiveness with scale and its scalability. That concludes my presentation. So I'm happy to take any questions you may have. <laughs> Okay. Um, so if you want to press turn on your microphone and give your name and organization. Hi. One, two, three. Okay. My name is uh, Dejan Stojanovic, uh, coming from ESB, Engineering and Major Projects um, Unit that delivers quite a lot of major projects across the country, working closely with AirGrid, um, currently on major projects in um, around Dublin myself. And I'm working here for about 20 years in Republic of Ireland. So um, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, I have actually a few different uh, sphere of questions. Uh, first one would be related to our superconductor. As you mentioned, HTS um, uh, could raise up to 200 Celsius um, degree. I think ESB already had uh, in the past uh, HTLS conductor, which is aluminium, which had small gap between core, um, steel core and aluminium, which actually grow traditional 80 and 90 degrees for aluminium and copper into, into 200 degrees. Technology is used successfully um, in Ireland. Um, However, it couldn't uh, guarantee uh, the amount of energy that you are discussing here today. Anyways, um, talking about Chinese um, solution for transferring energy with the ceiling, uh, 12 gigawatts on that uh, length of 3.3 thousand uh, kilometers is um, serious. And I would say it's only possible with very high voltages. And obviously that's alternative to if we if we don't have sufficient amount of superconductors um, to to minimize Julian losses, we would go with extra high voltages, I suppose, as alternative. But the questions here I have are really, um, I think, uh, when you talk European and pan-European levels, um, DC links um, that would need to synchronize different countries um, for synchronization reasons. I think these are going to be bottlenecks, uh, considering that electronic equipment um, that we currently operate might not be um, really ready for um, that large scales of of of, uh, of kickers that you that you are talking about. Possibly, I'm not hundred percent sure. Uh, that's that's question. Did, did you consider that um, um, nodes? You had nodes and you had links between countries. Beautiful slide. Uh, did you consider uh, these bottlenecks in in uh, in DC links and conversion AC to DC and DC to AC? Uh, that's the, that's the question actually. Next thing about nuclear, I think that we need to seriously consider that in Republic of Ireland. And what I also think is, before we even consider it, that um, our our leaders uh, in the country should actually drive education system all over the place in Ireland, in UCD, Trinity, everywhere, where we will grow generation up to be ready for that nuclear when it comes that you don't need to import every single expert from abroad. That is um, that is suggestion rather than question. But if, if nuclear is taken seriously, and I think it should be taken seriously, 
um, to 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 that that is uh, very long now very very long talk. Apologies for that. My final line is: you mentioned we're going back in time up to Edison. Now that nothing changed, I have small correction there. It's up to Tesla because he wants this war currents there. <laughs> Tesla Edison war, yes. which is the same time anyway. They work together. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, no Tesla. Um, um, was 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 a genius, and uh, Edison uh, was a rich man. Um, so, um, but the innovation happened back then, and we've relied on it and and perfected it, and and have a very reliable energy system today. Because for a hundred years, utilities have have kept it very reliable and very safe, and 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 I was part of that. Just a clarification on the temperature. So a superconductor is 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 minus two hundred degrees Celsius. So it's not like high temperature, low sag technology. This is keep it below its critical temperature, keep it super cool, and it will transmit energy with zero resistance. So high amounts. So it, it, it's keeping it cool. It's the opposite problem to copper where the, the insulation traps the heat and you, you literally melt the insulation if you put too much current through a copper. That's never an issue with the, with the superconductor. It's, it's critical current is beyond so that's that's probably that's just a clarification in case I wasn't entirely clear. Um, the bottlenecks issue is a very good point. Um, so we talk about an overlay grid uh, where the, the DC lines are like motorways and the existing national grids, the AC grids that serve us so well today with fossil fuels, I would add, they're designed around fossil fuel dependency. They, they continue to operate. And there's no bottlenecks because DC to DC. Today, the, the interconnection, which I've developed and I've been part of that, the Celtic interconnector, the Moyle interconnector, all the interconnectors, they're point-to-point -point interconnectors that always piggyback on the AC system. So they will always be capacity constrained. So if you think about the size of the East-West interconnector is half a gigawatt, and we're talking about 30 gigawatts and with a six gigawatt system. So it just doesn't work. You're not going to put that energy through the AC system and then put it back up. It, it, so it's very much an overlay network. So this super grid is an overlay network where you've got DC nodes that transmit very high levels of energy from A to B and, and give the AC network what it needs. So it's futuristic, uh, it's, it, it's a paradigm shift and we have to get our heads around it because we're running to a standstill in the energy community, trying to expect a system that was designed for 25% with fossil fuels to do 75% of energy without fossil fuels. On, on the nuclear question, uh, nuclear doesn't create carbon. So it's carbon that we're trying to take out of the system. So in our models, we have nuclear uh, modeled in the system. The nuclear question in Ireland that's a political question. I don't know. Eddie might want to comment on that. Yeah, well, uh, nuclear is interesting. Uh, just uh, some costs there. Um, the, the only reliable costs we have to go on that are transparent in England at Hinkley Point, they're, they're building a, a very large nuclear power station. And the cost in 2011 pounds uh, is 9.25 pence uh, per unit. On the last offshore bid in the UK, Shell bid 3.96 pence per unit. Now, you know, this is this is an enormous difference, and this would be for 55% capacity factor out on the dollar bank. Um, and then there's the 30-year uh, when you have to keep cesium and strontium, as you know, cesium, strontium uh, resembles calcium, and so it goes straight into the into your bones and bone cancer and so on. Um, and that has to be looked after for 30 years. And we had a presentation at the uh, a couple of weeks ago at the Engineers Ireland do in, in the conference centre in Dublin. And we had a guy from Rolls-Royce talking about modular uh, nuclear. Um, very, very interesting, great sales presentation. And he talked about keeping all the these nuclear um, cesium and strontium and iodine and plutonium on site. The terror stream you have to spend money to protect these things because you can make a dirty bomb very easily. One ton of explosives surrounded by a bunch of strontium and, and you've probably killed a million people. Um, so, 
So, but I'm not again. You know, I I think we we can do nuclear. We have to be prepared to pay for it. Uh, and by comparison with with wind, you can take down a turbine. You can it's never you know you can dispose of it just like that. Uh, you might have to store the blades in some place uh, because they they don't dispose of very easily. But it's no there's nothing wrong with them. You know, people steal them. They can't do anything with them. So um, so but they do make electricity without CO two. And the cost is probably worth it if you didn't have wind and, and solar. I mean, we're building solar in mainstream now for $1.5 cents in Chile. Right. And as I said, nuclear is 9.25, the only reliable real figure we have. So we have, um, we have two questions on the chat box or in the Q&A box, and then we can come back to the floor in here. So I have two questions for the panel. The first one is from Kieran Horgan. I'm going to have to read it out. A wonderful presentation, an exciting prospect for the future. Circuits will be more expense, expensive than conventional circuits, and so perhaps standby redundancy circuits may not be practical. Can you comment, please, on techniques to be developed to address circuit failure by perhaps loss of the coolant, et cetera? So that's an excellent question. So um, certainly the characteristics of a superconducting circuit are different from, from uh, copper and aluminium conventional conductors, I should have called them. And you do need to plan for the loss of any single circuit. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. So no circuit is infallible. So you, you, will, you will have failures. And we, we, we aim to achieve the same reliability as copper and aluminium cables so that's that's just a starting point but you do need a slightly different philosophy because you have more overload capacity and um, you also have um, a fault limiting characteristic so when you have a fault on a copper cable and quite often to discover the fault um, they'll actually increase the voltage and try and 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 and, and force uh, increase the fault so they can find the the, the, the fault um, with, a, with a superconductor, when there is a fault, if there's a loss of heat, the superconductor will, will stop conducting. And there's a copper sheet there that will take a fault current until protection clears it. So inherently with a superconductor, the fault current reduces. So even though the initial current is higher, the fault current can be lower. So there are different characteristics. So certainly the control strategies and the, the network development strategies need to be developed for adopting this technology. We can continue to use superconductors to beef up our existing systems, be it increasing the level of power we bring into the center of our, of our urban cities. But if we're going to realize it for pan-European grid, continental scale grids and bigger grids, we need to rethink how we plan and develop our grids. And we need to do that anyway. Even without superconductors, we need a DC grid. It's, it's accepted in the last two or three years that we need a meshed DC grid in the North Sea. And that's becoming commonly accepted in energy circles in Brussels amongst the TSOs. And they're planning for islands and meshed DC grids because we need the reliability. If you lose a circuit, you need to be able to put that power, reroute that power onto another circuit. With superconductors, we'll have to do that as well. So they'll, they'll, they'll have the same level of redundancy will be required. Um, we just need bigger systems because we'll carry more power in each circuit. So it's, 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 there are similarities and differences and we need, to, we need to sit down and map our way back from 2050 to today. And, and it really does call for innovation and innovative thinking. Um, and that's the challenge. And we have an added challenge in Europe in that we're not a federal Europe. We're a collection of member states. So unlike America and, and China, um, this is not within the gift of a single government to decree that we need to build a line 2000 kilometers or do something. We need the political consensus. And to get the political consensus, we probably need about 25% of the population to really want it because that's what change, that's what requires change. Now, I'm not calling for revolution or riots or anything like that, but we do need to be pushing for it. Increasingly, the younger generation will require this. And I think like there's, there, there is a debate going on in energy circles at the moment. Some people in the TSO community are saying the policymakers need to change their ask to reflect the reality of what is achievable. 
And that is what you call the conservative wing. And you have the academic thinkers who believe we need to innovate to meet the policymakers' needs. So for me, which is the tail, it's the tail wagging the dog. So I think we need to meet the policymakers' asks, which is decarbonization. Okay, so I'm going to take two more questions from the webinar, and then I'm going to come back to the floor. Um, so this question is from John Gibbon. It's on a similar theme. Have you any idea how we would keep the undersea cables at minus 200 degrees centigrade on the deep sea ocean floor? How would we feed the liquid nitrogen down to them in the event of a failure? Well, um, I hope to, if John's an engineer, we, we, we give him a job because that's what we're really focused on doing. Um, we, we are focusing on going further. So at the moment, state of the art can do about 15 to 20 kilometers without re recooling and replenishing the liquid nitrogen. Firstly, liquid nitrogen uh, costs about probably less than milk. Oh, and yeah, well, third price. So it's plentiful. How we do it on the deep sea, we will have repeater stations uh, probably every 50 or 100 kilometers uh, where we will recool and replenish. And this will use similar technology to which Microsoft used with their data center off the Orkneys a few years ago. So we will have a pod, two pods, um, that will have provide standard temperature and pressure for the recooling and, and, and repumping. Re what we, our mantra is, is if the superconductor knows it's in a marine setting, something's gone wrong already. Yeah. Okay, another question from John, I think. This is from Charles Smith from Mayo. Has Supernode considered a single node failure and how routing around a failed cable segment, either onshore or offshore? See recent failures of Nord Stream 1 and 2. So, um, yeah, Nord Stream 1 and 2 were, were certainly failures. And I know that, that the Norwegians are very exercised about the security of their, uh, their, their, their pipelines, their cables, um, because of what happened with Nord Stream. And I think it happened at a particularly sensitive time when a new gas pipeline to Europe from Norway was being commissioned, in fact, during the ceremony. So you can never uh, um, prevent a fault and it needs to be fault proof. In terms of the routing and the design, Supernode is a small company developing technology. We're not designers of the grid. We're proponents of it. We're supporters of it. We, we see the need for it, but it's really going to take a pan-European TSO, a single independent system operator, an architect, if you like, to develop the energy system back from 2050 that we need. And such a body can design and plan for that. Like There are many, many great engineers working in utilities around Europe who do this day in, day out, and they will need to apply themselves to the challenge of developing a pan-European grid. So it's a challenge for all of us, not just Supernode. So we will play a part, a very small part. We'll develop technology that can do it, but designing the grid is beyond our remit. Okay. So anyone in the floor in the room here Any question? Yeah. Okay, John, please. Uh, thank you, Tony, for the invite here tonight, and Eddie and John for the presentation. My name is John Gagan, and I'm the president here in Mullingar Chamber. And um, we'd be we'd have one of the largest SECs in the country in 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 Mullingar. We have a very exercised group of members who are fascinated and and energized around the whole issue of renewable energy. And uh, we I really enjoyed the presentation there tonight. I think it's very informative. And I have a couple of questions for you, just in terms of. Um, you mentioned the TDL scale, and uh, I'm wondering what scale you would see us in in terms of how much, how far behind we are, and and where we need to be in in solving the energy crisis in Ireland, and also the planning constraints issue in terms of delivering this. How 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 do you see the current planning legislation, and what changes are needed to make this deliverable? And then by listening to the overall presentation, it sounds to me like Project Mara. You know, might be dead before it's even started if, if the scale of the problem is as big as it sounds, and maybe that needs to be revisited. I'm wondering what you think about that, and uh, keen to hear your views. Thanks, Amin. Thank you, John. Certainly, um, if you look at the record to date, um, you know, we, we wouldn't think that we had much of a chance of competing with, with you know, Portugal has had been experimenting with wave. Uh, with wind, um, with with all kinds of stuff for the last 15 years. 
Um, when we built the Arklow Banks wind farm in 2003, we did it without any government support. In fact, they ran a competition in 2004 and we bid what it cost us, 8.4 cents. Uh, <clears throat> somebody, uh, some another group uh, of mountaineers from Kerry bid at 7.8 and they were awarded a contract. Um, and of course they never built it. Um, and now they're claiming that they're traditional rights so you know we're not we're not very serious about this, but and that's why we are putting so much attention here um, to to the public affairs element, and that's why I'm I'm very happy to see um, our former teacher Brian Collin here, who has expressed an interest uh, in this whole concept, and uh, we have met with uh, the Taoiseach, we've met with Leo Varadkar, uh, we've we've put these various points. It's going to take the whole of government here. Uh, to become interested in this. Uh, the Department of Housing, as far as I know, grants the, le the leasing of offshore territory. Uh, the Department of the Environment sets the, uh, the planning um, constraints or the planning requirements. Um, the, the IDA has to attract in people here uh, from abroad. The Department of Energy obviously has, has, has got to play a role. The Department of Finance becomes involved because we need to start spending a very small amount but a significant amount of money. Uh, where are we going to put these turbines off the West Coast? I mean, you just can't put them anywhere. Uh, you could be over a trough, and you've also got to consider, well, where is the pathway you're going to run the cable from? So, you know, we, the Department of Foreign Affairs is very impor important in all this because we've got to convince uh, the people in, in Hungary, the people in Poland, people in Italy, that Ireland is going to become a source of real power for them that's going to replace what they have already. So there's all these government departments involved and, and, and our policy has been that we're going to try and make sure that this is run from the Taoiseach's office and that it's not left to any one department because it will not happen if it's left to any one department. Uh, so, and we've also been engaged with the ports. Um, very happy uh, to see Connor here, um, great. Uh, uh, to you know, and they're getting fired up uh, as well. So, and and our our goal is to create a constituency in Ireland that just won't let the politicians off off the hook uh, that they have set for themselves. Um, and and we you know we will be certainly um, you know very very active in that sphere. Just just coming back in on that, if I could for a second, economically, you mentioned 3.3 .3 trillion to deliver the, the project and 300 billion annual cost of power in Europe. Like it seems like an economic logical solution for this issue. And 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 is that something there, there seems to be no barrier there. So the barrier seems to be really planning and government policy. I, I, am I right on that? Yeah, well, the, the, the total cost, as far as we, we can tell, uh, if you know, based on our assumptions, which are broadly in line with the assumptions that um, we've seen coming from the International Energy Agency, from IRENA, from uh, uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and from the EU themselves. So our costs are roughly in line with them of 2.58 trillion to build uh, all the generation plant plus the plus the um, the supergrid. Um, and, and the cost we pay each year are 330 billion for fossil fuels, and we won't be paying that anymore, which gives a very short payback period. But the problem is that all electricity systems have been national up to now. I mean, the ESB runs Ireland, you know, and, and, and used to up, up till 2000, it was just, it was a monopoly. Um, and you have more or less the same thing, whether it's private or publicly owned, they all think nationally. So what we have to do and what was to work with Europe and we have to find partners in Europe who see the world a bit like we see it and we have to convince them that this now becomes um, if you like a federal European issue that we're going to be relying on ourselves we're not going to be importing oil from Saudi Arabia or from Abu Dhabi or wherever it comes from or gas from Russia or gas from wherever um, we are going to be making it ourselves and and so we need to you know we we need to think collectively as a nation on this one um, and uh, and we'll be publishing a book, by the way, in February, which I hope you're all going to uh, buy, um, which outlines the, how this is to be done in Europe. And, and John's been talking a lot about it, but we have been extremely active uh, in Europe um, and, and, and we're slowly convincing people that, you know, dream big here. 
There's no point in thinking small. There's no point in... in th the world is, is literally in a state of collapse right now with global warming. I mean, it's, it's got to such a critical stage that unless we do something imaginative, we've already passed the 1.5 uh, degree rise. I don't think we can possibly meet. We have to build, just give you an example. If you take the figures we mentioned there, we have to build 830 megawatts every week from now till 2050 if we want to meet uh, the decarbonization targets. Last year, we built 63, and this year we built less. So every year, this whole problem that we have gets worse instead of getting better. We released 50 billion tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere last year, and we do the same this year. Now, some of that is it's not all energy. Some of that is, is you know, what Mullingar is famous for, you know, steaks and all that kind of stuff. But I believe that's all soluble if we had a will to do it. So we have another question in the room here, and I'm just going to ask the gentleman to give his name, his organisation, and ask his question. Colin Markey, a Midlands Northwest MEP. I've had a big interest in this area for a good while now. Just a number of questions in relation to it. Um, firstly, in relation to the cable, you talked about, obviously, the person talked about getting hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, or liquid nitrogen, should I say, back into the cable if there was damage. What's the ongoing maintenance situation as regards the cable and maintaining liquid nitrogen in the cable? That's just, a, I suppose, a technical question. At a different level, then, you talk about the, the level of ambition, particularly at European level. The whole 10E concept in terms of a European energy network, what's been talked about at European level, is it to a scale that's appropriate to the need? I suppose, an opinion as regards that. I suppose, secondly, for many given the significant potential there is off the West Coast, and we can talk 30, you can talk 80, you can talk 300. It's like pick your number, it seems to be at this stage, but there's no doubt there's enormous scale. And for some, that's about a, the, the solution is to convert an awful lot of that into hydrogen. To me, you're talking, when you convert into hydrogen, reconvert that into electricity in whatever way or whatever form you have, that there's enormous losses off that. So just have you any position as regards the concept of converting into hydrogen? And uh, finally, I suppose if you kind of alluded to it there, when you look to the legislative framework in terms of delivering offshore wind in Ireland, or just not necessarily just Ireland, but you say we're well behind other countries, what you mentioned the Taoiseach's office being the lead department on, on it, what could we do to, to, to streamline or to straighten out to make that more practical? I often talk to someone and say, if you go to the Scots or the Scandinavians, they say, sure, we'll come over and do it for you. And if we don't get right together, that's what's going to happen. So just curious if you have any perspective on those three questions. Thanks. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with the, the, um, the liquid nitrogen question about the maintenance of, of the cable compared to conventional cables. So the, the like sea cables are very risky in terms of, you know, things go wrong with them and utilities are very wary of sea cables because they're hard to repair, they're hard to fix. We're designing our sea cables so it will be installable and maintainable with similar technology in ships to conventional cables. So it looks like a regular cable, it's readable, it's installable, it'll be modular. We'll have greater degree of monitoring on the cable. So if there is a fault, we'll have a better, we will know where it is and we'll be able to repair it in a similar amount of time that you could repair a copper cable. So we're benchmarking off copper reliability and availability. And that's on us, and that's what we're going to. That's where we're going to deliver, and we've got to demonstrate that and prove it over in the coming years. So that's that's the first question. The next question is on 10E. So we like to call 10E, and we were very involved and engaged in the 10E revision process. So 10E is the Trans European Networks for Energy, and there they have similar for transport, and they are the this directive by which interconnectors and interconnectivity between uh, countries both in oil between gas and electricity get get invested in and made i've been involved in in tenny for for over 10 years and uh, maybe 15 uh, for, as a tso and looking in now commenting on it and i think they've gone for a sea basins approach uh, where they've 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 carved up europe into six different regions and said that they're they, they've made provision for member states and uh, about a month or two ago here, the energy min ministries of the North Seas Group met here in, in, in Dunleary actually, and stated they wanted to do circa 290 gigawatts in the North Seas. And they are a, a combination of member states' ambitions, and they will go be fed into the 10E 
and then the TSOs will have to come up with a plan to accommodate that. I think doing it regionally, you miss what Eddie talked about because like you, you, you can't optimize locally and then say it's a, it's a pan-European optimization. So if you have a storm tracking uh, west to east across Northern Europe and you have a meshed grid in the North Sea and another meshed grid somewhere else, they can't feed, feed one another optimally. And the north, the north south with the solar, the best solar is in the south. So if you look to the UK and some of their, their I would say, um, interesting, and that's that's diplomatic word, uh, interesting plans to connect solar from North Africa directly to to the UK. It's a recognition that the irradiance in the Mediterranean basin is far superior to what we get here. Um, and I think you miss that if you don't have a proper pan-European grid. So I think it's a step in the right direction. And, and the, the ultimate conclusion of that, subject to political, and, and the NCBs have said, this is a political question, is a pan-European approach to designing a grid and developing a grid. And that, that, that will deliver a more robust, renewably powered energy system with some nuclear and, 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 and some storage as well, which is, which is a big part of this. Um, another, you know, like it's a big, it's a big problem space. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember your third question, which was probably more political. So I'll... I, 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 I think that was about hydrogen. Well, first of all, I'd kind of like to welcome you here. Thanks very much. I understand how, how busy an MEP must be. So thank you very much for being in attendance here. It's, uh, it's very important that, that our members of European Parliament actually are aware of the trade-offs here and, and what can happen for Ireland if we, if we actually get this done. Hydrogen is is um, it's all the rage lately. Um, you put a hundred megawatt hours uh, of electricity into water, you'll get out fifty nine megawatt hours of hydrogen, right? So you lose, you know, you lose forty percent of it straight away, more probably. Um, and then you have to burn hydrogen, right? Now, so just take transport. This is the this is kind of the big one. If you take a hundred megawatt hours and put it into the batteries of cars you're probably going to get out 85 megawatt hours of, of that's going to drive the wheels. If you make hydrogen out of that, well, first of all, you're only going to get 59 uh, to do the work. And if you put it into an internal combustion engine, that's 20% efficiency. So your overall, you put in your 100 megawatt hours of electricity, you get out about 12 uh, to drive the wheels. If you put it into a fuel cell, which Elon Musk called fuel cells, you get a, it's about 50% efficient. So 50% of 60% is 30% as against your battery. So they just can't compete. Um, and it's a wonderful invention of the fossil fuel industry. I just, whoever thought it up, it was a stroke of genius because they say, oh, but you can't, we'll, we'll have the hydrogen thing cracked in about 20 years. In the meantime, what do we do? We have blue hydrogen. You know what blue hydrogen is? Ladies and gentlemen, Blue hydrogen is 95% natural gas and 5% hydrogen. And the real kicker is, uh, but we don't want to, we want to test this first to see if hydrogen works. So we'll make our hydrogen from natural gas. So we'll have all natural gas, uh, except very inefficient. So the hydrogen thing is the greatest piece of scam that I've ever seen in my life or ever heard of or dreamt of. And it saddens me to see that Fexco down in Kerry are talking about investing a billion offshore and 8 billion in hydrogen. Um, it's, it's a brilliant piece of, of if you like, uh, how would you call it, what Trump used to do, misdirection. Um, we, we'll see hydrogen for the 70 million tonnes that are made in the world uh, as, a, as a chemical feedstock. That will have to be made now out of water. And I think the steel making, Steel making, which if it were a country, would be the fifth biggest emitter in the world, turning iron ore into iron. Um, that'll probably require 300 million tons. And there might be some other needs, maybe cement making, certainly in glass making. Um, so 500 million tons of hydrogen is what the world's going to need, but the rest will be all electricity. And the hydrogen will be made from electricity as well. Only if we went for more than that, you'd probably have to double the amount of offshore wind and onshore wind you'd have to build. But it's, it's a brilliant piece of misdirection. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Eddie. So we've got a couple of questions uh, on the webinar uh, Q&A feature. There's three of them here. And um, 
We'll go through those and then I'll come back to the room again because I think there's a couple of interested people down there. So this is a short one. Michael O'Hearn, what is the maximum length of superconductor cable without having to break for coolant servicing? Um, in the world, uh, today, state-of-the-art is claimed to be about 15 to 18 kilometers. Um, so the longest it would probably be the 12 kilometer cable plan for, for, for Munich. Um, that's with an AC. Uh, with DC, actually, would you believe it? Superconductors prefer DC to, to AC because the, the, their, um, it, it just suits them better in terms of their, the, the, the heat generated. So, uh, which is, you know, very, very small, but it's probably 20 kilometers with DC and Supernode aimed to take that out to 50 uh, with, with their existing technology, um, which is under development at the moment. There are other companies uh, and Supernode too, um, we're developing technology to take that to 100 kilometers. So I think 100 kilometers is doable, uh, but it's gonna take a fair bit of engineering. And I suppose a, a point to make is here, superconductors work, we're not, we're not, uh, this is not fusion. This is not far away stuff. This is engineering. We're not breaking the laws of physics here. We're just engineering them, yeah. Okay, thank you, John. So this question's from uh, Robert Kuchart and it's as follows. In terms of education for new engineers coming into the renewables market, do you see a cover of what is needed to bring the superconductor technology forward? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is my friend Charles Smith, uh, formerly of Shell and on the Engineers Ireland Electrical and Computing Division Committee, I think. So Charles wants to know, also nuclear is not really practical for Ireland, as we would need a, a suitable national regulator body to oversee the design and operation of a nuclear industry, plus train 200 technicians per year per plant. This is the first the first mini nuclear Rolls-Royce plant would only be commissioned in 2029. Is this true? Okay. Uh, the last question I'm going to take from the, the Q&A feature, and then I'll come back to the room, um, is from Pat Casey. Thank you very much for a clear presentation. Where do you see hydrogen fitting into the energy equation, and could it be the answer to nuclear? I think you've... I might just say that that hydrogen has a role um, for sure. And if we fail in electricity, uh, we'll all be relying on hydrogen and paying a lot more for our electricity. And um, so I have a simple rule. Um, if it's electrons you need, then stick with electrons. If it's molecules you need, then go for the molecules. And I think that, that that's a rule that would serve us, serve as well if we, if we all applied it, I think. Okay, so have we any questions from the floor? Anyone? Don't be shy. Okay, okay. There's one or two other ones here in the chat box. Um, Charles is, is again typing into us. Um, some of these are a statement, Charles. Uh, it's not really a question. Um, no, they're all statements, and I think they've already been covered. So are there any, any other questions from the floor? Sorry, Sean. Sorry, it's a bit of multi-parter. I'll be quick. Uh, Sean Clancy, Westmead County Council, Transportation Section. Just regarding the semiconductor themselves, and I know you uh, referenced this in the MEP's question, but just what sort of lifespan are you expecting on a conductor? And then when we get into maintenance, I know you talk about overlaying it over existing grid, but imagine hypothetically, well, not hypothetically, if it does work, it will be brought into local grids as well. And we, we get to local maintenance and local infrastructure and then the the traditional line strikes or whatever what are they going to be what are the implications going to be there and and then secondly i know you're talking about the foreign foreign affairs and going abroad to talk to uh, the electrical industries in other countries are the esp on board here before we start going abroad i, I know we do need to look at it as a broader scale but are the esp on board on it um i i'll i'll start at the beginning um, so in terms of maintenance, if, 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 like, if you cryogenically freeze things, right, at minus 200 degrees Celsius, they age slower. So this stuff will be under less stress than the, 
the copper cables that you know that are you know cycling hot to cold depending on the load on them these they don't they don't suffer that so they they should last 40 plus years and we're designing it for 40 years plus in terms of maintenance yeah sure there's going to be jobs and there's going to be uh, uh, developed in terms of this this the, this industry and i would say this industry is up for grabs it doesn't exist it's a nascent industry uh, it's young in europe yeah, Europe has a great competency in in superconductivity, um, and we can we can build these factories here in Ireland, and we can export that to other countries. So we're not the only people who need connectivity. We have a particularly acute situation with we're long on renewables off our west coast, and we're short in demand. But every region of the world needs greater levels of connectivity because renewables don't tend to to coexist with demand centres anywhere. And um, so this is something we're all going to have to get used to. So there will be new industries, there'll be new methods, and that's the nature of the beast and bring it on because this is, this is, this is jobs and economic prosperity for those who lead. Um, the, the, the rest of the questions I'm, 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 I'm struggling to remember. The ESB. The ESB or the ESB on board. And um, that's, that's probably the wrong place to start with due respect. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's where, I, I suggest some of our policymakers fall down. We don't have a very, we don't have a big oil and gas industry. I've been at Wind Europe where we've been addressed by the Minister for Energy and the Prime Minister of some countries where energy is a big deal for them. These are typically countries, you know, like if you go to Scotland, if you go to Norway, you know, energy is a big deal for them. Here, it's something DSB look after. And that's probably the first thing and no disrespect to ESB, but we can't expect ESB to solve all our problems. We've got to grow up. Very low risk in territory. We don't have Julian losses. We don't have Julian losses in, within within conductor. Obviously, your 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 nitrogen and everything else have to be thermally. So you have to have. So there is thermal conductivity, obviously, and there is radiation convention and uh, con con conduction of of thermal of thermal energy. Quarks, yeah. How how would you how how is that managed in uh, in uh, other on other shields? How how heavy is conductor itself? So per meter, it's very good engineering question for for example replacement of existing condu conductors. Would you have so mechanical parameters? So the conductor is is is, is trivial in terms of weight terms. Trivial. So okay. that that's a a, a tape. One percent of that is the conductor. The rest is. Um, a metal substrate, um, um, hastaloid. hastaloid, to keep it strong and to protect okay. it. So the conductor, you know, is is not is not the constraint. You're very, you're right. Keeping it cool is the challenge because the the outer environment tries to heat it. So we're using technology that's been used in 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 the LNG business, keeping LNG which needs to be cooled for transport. So it's a pipe in a pipe with a vacuum and some very advanced thermal uh, materials to keep it insulated because we're trying to fight conduction, convection and radiation. And we've got a state-of-the-art cryogenic center uh, here in Ireland, which has been developed, um, which you know has material that can, uh, that has a kit that can actually demonstrate the conductivity and the thermal radiation through the barrier um, in ways that you can only read in textbooks. So people are approaching us now to measure their materials because we've got some very good equipment that can do that. And that's that's the key challenge for Supernode is to do that better than anybody else because it's hard to sell something that's that's second best. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you.